Welcome to Occupy Poetics, an event I thought of hosting last year at this time, but held off during the election. You remember last year, right? Um, something technically 365 days ago, but which has taken its toll on the American psyche via the American psycho. In such a way that time and space, if they weren't already, have been totally obliterated. Trump was elected president one week before the fifth anniversary of Bloomberg's uh, Zuccotti Park eviction, when I might add 300 3,600 books were also seized by the sanitation department. I first met Philip Marinovich Unter den Linden of Zuccotti Park, where he and Stephen Boyer were working at the People's Library. I think it was, I was there the day after Naomi Klein or somebody had donated her books to the- uh... We were there the day Christina Davis arrived. <sighs> One and the same. Um, and as a librarian, I'd never seen so much varied and vigorous and intimate circulation of the word, and I was totally ecstatic. I first met Mitch Manning, poet, organizer, and editor of No Infinite, a journal of poetry and protest, and some art in between, uh, that same fall. He started his MFA at UMass Boston the same month, I'd say, that Occupy, yeah, Boston Occupy, uh, began to set up its encampment on Dewey Square. I've invited them here tonight, not so much to represent Occupy, which I think would be impossible, if not ill-advised, um, but to share work of their own and others that they associate with Occupy's continued momentum. If we think of roots of being rooted in Occupy less as a tree's anchor than its mode of communication and communing, what are the gestures, currents, structures, vocabularies, modes of convening and attention that have emerged and morphed since they took root uh, in 2011? Uh, as a poet and activist uh, myself, I'm interested in structures, structures that uh, are recognizable as such but are loose enough to allow, are sufficiently osmotic, ad adaptive, generative, blent, and decent centralized to encourage and foster, I'm just going to keep you know, adding some words here, um, Whitmanic little moment here, uh, extremities of expression, admission, questioning, critique, and also when necessary, exodus. What interests me most about Occupy circa 2011 was its profound connectivity and genuine exchange across communities, including literary communities, which aren't always, you know, exchanging and communing. Uh, poets in Oakland, New York, Boston, London, uh, and other cities worldwide were catalyzed by conversation. Socialists were debating with anarchists. I mean, you know, maybe they do that secretly every day, but um, they were admitting it. Uh, and in each city or town where an encampment or aggregate grew in such a non-presencing period in which we find ourselves, in which the remoteness of social media gives us access to each other in myriad significant ways, but also sacrifices other forms of amongness, occupy returned us to bodies and compelled us to confront not only the constituents of the 1%, but also the complex and unpredictable particulates of our collective physical presence. If poetry is a means to awaken us to, uh, awaken us to what we have disattended, so too is activism, and so is tonight's reading slash conversation. Here to activate the dimensions of Occupy and to celebrate our preoccupation with poetry. <laughs> I mean, come on, it's been done. Uh, our, um, but this hasn't been done. Uh, but playing on the word Occupy has tragically um, been done. Uh, are Philip Marinovich and Mitch Manning. So please welcome them. Thank you. For occupation, this, a spell to heal Occupy <coughs> Wall Street PTSD. For occupation, this, a spell to heal Occupy Wall Street PTSD. I dwell in possibility. For occupation, this, a spell to heal Occupy Wall Street PTSD. I dwell in possibility, a fairer house than prose, more numerous of windows, superior for doors, of chambers as the cedars, impregnable of eye, and for an everlasting roof, the gambrels of the sky, of visitors, the fairest, 
For occupation, this. The spreading wide my narrow hands to gather paradise. Emily Dickinson. We neither occupy nor have, but rather share space-time. Fred Moten. We neither occupy nor have, but rather sh are space-time. We neither occupy nor have, but rather are space-time. Fred Moten. Honestly, it sounds kind of crazy, but I dreamed about this, not in a conscious way, but literally, years before it happened. And then it did happen. Betsy Fagan. For occupation this, Lundi Boots, 10 9, 17. I remember Occupy Wall Street, New York chapter, the People's Library at Zuccotti Park. Rhiannon plays on the coffee shop stereo, so much for that frame, friends. But what is the way to Dover? Is that a good cookbook? Violin practice heals the goiter within a week or your iguana back. Let's see your profile, knight. There's something different about this coffee today. Rhiannon must have cried into it. Prima. I invoke you, goddess lotus, president, dented and dented paragraph of Delft. So to stop you short right there, what do the owl and unicorn say to each other? Olive dialogue. The color or, yes, and the oil. The olive trees and the crows within them. The most important editor is posture and breathing during the time of composition. That's why I'm hunched over. It's not a monologue with antiquity or anything else. It's a dialogue with my brother in California who wounded me deep this summer, or was it last? Or does summer end anymore? And we must not call it Indian, but ecocidal capitalist summer of the lost frères at Trois Frères Cave, where the spelunkers go to cool off the long heat wave December months in the northern hemisphere of the brain. The paragraph breaks. Aren't you tracking yourself too closely? Owl says, shrug it off, leave breath for a power surge. Unicorn says, the corn's on my feet? I have hooves. You are drawing a false equivalency, malted milkshake from the soda fountain of nerve. That's one too many mixes ahead of you and a thousand months behind the stove stew of tomatoes, friendly nightshades, vines grown up around the ankles to hold the future close in Aquarian circulatory system. The spider repelled downward over the glowing keys of the laptop computer until all that ease turned into fitful joy. Who now to flirt with? The letters are so much smaller. I need a brother to talk with, but he's out editing dailies in California. Who to be with now? And he's gone. And boyfriend gone. In the fire. The Oikos house economy. Mia economia. Mia pow. And back again. A veteran with one hand. The other in the oil economy sand. Take two on sand and get out of that oil trap, Harry. Where did you go and brother come back? Always a mistake to read back through two sentences beforehand, thereby ruining the REM rollover eye math. Eyeball chaff and wheat, harvest nothing, abandon all hope of fruition. The Oikos house on fire and who will you rescue? The grandfather clock or the grandfather? The friends, the parents, the teachers, the kids, the little children, and suffer the little children, don't suffer the little children, nothing. Let those proverbs go and verb yourself into the no if you can. If not, and if so, both. It's delusion, because you don't believe you will die, do you? It is an intellectual maneuver to say you do, but do you feel it with your whole calfskin? Cheryl says a major physics discovery about the Earth's gravitational axis is to be announced tomorrow at 11 a.m. Perfect! Just in time for my train ride to Boston. Will I be thinking about that then, or just pouring hot coffee on my wrist, imagining you saying, prima, prima, in baby German, German soft language baba talk for excellent. How excellent is it when the wisteria above our heads offers its winding steps to get to the top of it, the red brick list of incidents, and shall we pause for a spot of research on our phones, Pegasus? Once 20 minutes runs out, we can go back to candelabra making camp and learn how to solder the iron to the very elbow going out ahead of the body. The third elbow departs from my body in brassy candelabra shadow, and the third elbow advanced scout goes ahead of the red beef curtain to see what's ahead. What the unicorn said. Ingredients, ing, damozels, experience. 
When you descended into Zuccotti Kitty Pool, did the pee-pee taste like the future you had heard of in your golden shower wet dreams after watching the Blue Jays mate in the open air aviary of the Ramble Central Park? And you would not stop to be cruised. The plastic bird feeder tubes dangling in branches above. It is not a monologue. It is a dialogue with the estranged brother who won't speak to me in California because dailies are more important than anger management. And how can you all, after all, manage anger when the Oikos, oink, oink, economy house is on fire and you must rescue your friends and there is no fire escape and you cannot resuscitate. You did not undergo the proper lifeguard CPR training. The chlorine got to you even at the edge of the pool. Chlorine, delphine, auto defenestrated, self badger mammon. How unkind to call yourself thus and yet how accurate withal. Where do we go to now for recovery? Somewhere soft and prima. Preemies, the diminutive for premature babies. I'm still preemie, and I just turned 42, but there is no fort can hide my hungry kitty kitty libido whiskers and milk whiskers, and milk says spider silk is a repelling cord. I can climb down Dover Zuccotti cliffside to get at the memory tide and wash my cut up feet in it as I bestride the fault of California meth lab earthquake or nautica, the ship that takes me out of the burning earth and flies me on autopilot to the nearest naproon immune system evacuated and white blood cells dissolving into horseshoe nebulas clanking around an unidentified flying iron nail. Who threw it? You threw it. Youth, who's youth? You with your milk tooth still invaginated in the semblance garden with the saliva of the librarian rain dripping down on you and cleansing you of the sea salt accumulated in the cuts you got scaling down the Adriatic cliff into the swim home, long and grateful for surviving the inadvisable steep climb down, 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 there, where gravity can be friend or enemy depending on the tide and how far it pulls you out and what rock can you jump from at the right angle not to break your third elbow, but let it ride out as a bone boat, carrying your dead self safe to the other side of the mountain you never knew was there till you climbed it. Hi. There is no peak to greet you, so you say hi, and the echo is not your ally, but a reminder of your inseparability from the surf. Hi. 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 Repeat after me. I George Washington, Pisces, fish father of our coin tree. I remember Occupy Wall Street, New York chapter, the People's Library at Zuccotti Park. Rhiannon plays on the coffee shop stereo. So much for that frame, friends. But what is the way to Dover? Is it a good cookbook? Violin practice heals the goiter within a week or your iguana back lets your profile all night. There's something different about this coffee today. Rhiannon must have cried into it. Why would you be symptomatic? Zuccotti Park nostalgia conjugation. It sucks. I sucked. You sucked. We sucked there. Wait, when did you break up? This summer. He probably wanted to sound sincere. Then I hooked up with Donut. Tarot Donut. He was still dating that teacher. They were dating? Look at her. Good for them. Yeah, I agree. I feel like he has a really credible job. Does she? I remember that. I remember Zuccotti Park, social life, platforming. The accumulation of poor Tom Snow, rethrow me, the foul fiend fellow. I haven't seen me since. The accumulation of cultural capital and friends and you becoming policemen you will never talk to again. Friends who accuse you of everything they do, but can't see, so they and you can continue to do it. Hey, nostalgia is a poisonous algae bloom in the Central Park Turtle Pond hippocampus. I remember when friends were buying hats to party at places. At a bar, they'll hug you. A greeting, and then defenestration. Friend defenestration. I know that sounds bad, but what the chaplain? You have to work up your arm strength somehow. The fall season is underway, even though heat stroke remains a daily danger in this our auto-destruct ecosphere. Oh, you are amused by it, are you? Thank you for your spiritually constructive memhoror. The author, Devin, has this really weird self-deprecating thing with this Tinder fellow right next door. He's me, the resonating hallway thing. Oh, he's, I'm so rotund. Rut, 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 gl gla, gla, glottal rut, glottal hut, glottal butt. Slottle gut, glottal mutt, glottal shut, glottal rut, 
Glottal author smoke after the break in a document house. I'm too embarrassed to say I'm into him because I'm intimidated, but we like cuddle a lot. His name is Memhoror. We're engaged. I'm engaged to the National Book Award. Yeah, same. In speeding up to bypass the politeness sensor, I become angry, cheap, unenjoying. How's that? Have I repented enough? Back at it. Jupiter ingressed into Scorpio just now, just this morning around 9.30 a.m. Eastern bandwidth time. Did you notice the changes? And get back to me if you do. I hope you feel better soon, for I do miss you. What advice could I give you that you have not already packed up into your red-on-red motley bundle? Have more than thou showest. No more storm rerun. Sunlight, keep it going. Sunlight, keep it going. Sunlight, keep it going. Sunlight, come on. Wear the dish rag. I had dinner with one of my friends. It's so joicy and I want to throw it out. Sub-joycyan, of course. Nothers by comparison. Five hours and then obedience school. I feel like we're not in. We are detention, water retention circus, bedbugs and sudden infestation of the librarian's apartment. The aliens are strange with their scheduling and sun flares give us precogs or metacogs to be more precise. Are you buried in a cog fin, uncle dragon, friend dragon, friend defenestration, ohm? You're studying Star Wars and you're just realizing bong puff upward past the face, the sword of state, what have you, and current events of the river hag, just to go do anything with Mara, even that would beat math homework, sitting under the cold tree all night to give it the warmth of your departed appetite. I wish I could remember, Temenos, Temenos, what the trees of Zuccotti jukebox told me, Temenos, Temenos, spear and barley and corn and whiskey and autumn time harvest pantry. Double, double, depublish the bubble of white supremacy soup fest. Depublish. Dissolve it, even though you know not how. Do it anyway. It is impossible, sob, sob, and impossibility. I'll see you in like 10 minutes. Possibility, thou fairer house than prose. I'll see you in like 10 midnights. Impossible, impossible of the cave of cries, freezing into radiating quartz chandeliers. Impossant fish, impossant fish, uncatchable, yes. Impossibility is the perfect aphrodisiac for you peripheral scribe of impossible ensemble itselfnesses, myriad experiencing themselfnesses, herselfnesses. For the age of Aquarius belongs to the women poets, and now I will shut up and continue. All was ready, shrilly whistle belly for the continuation of Le Long Voyage. The back of the silver laptop covered with rainbow stickers. Can I sleep in your laptop? Will you download me? I've been born into the wrong sex, but I don't know what it is, and there is no right one is the only thing I know. I know it emotionally. I don't know Jacques of Arden, Sherwood Forest, the Sea of Reeds, the Burnham Wood Babblethon of the forest of old high school Lake Kachikwik fire trail stolen from the native tribe, like everything else on this cursed land. Occupiers, we of the occupiers, taking back the Lenape land on the southern tip of Manhattan as if it were ours. We liver liberators ourselves, being tyrants to each other, and all around us the undercovers of the FBI and the undercovers of Occupy Poetry and Assembly Night say, daylight is fired. You can't be an editor of the Occupy Poetry Anthology. You can only be a facilitator. You say editor, I say facilitator. Let's call the whole thing soft in the head, soft boiled brain of a late October heat stroke. In this are severely strained strains of late Viennese Habsburg waltz states. What's the haps? The haps is in the flooded square where the sanitation workers cleaned out the occupiers with police sozzles. From Libra to Scorpio, the big change is the breath comes from the genitals, not kidneys anymore. And we are going south toward feet, toward the hour of six o'clock, dragon meridian, death and eros intertwine around the medicine tree by the drum circle, vibrating Liberty Plaza. The ghosts walk from ground zero and into us. We have visitors and don't know who they are. How do we cough this air out of us? It's not air, the guests, 
Gusts, Geist Guts. It, it time, did it start again? It ended my mouth instead. Did you see the lakes? I waded deep into Zuccotti Lake. You can get some really good seafood, especially holy waters. More cleanness and tasting. The third N in cleanness is for never, never. Never, never, never. The waters taught me their lessons and I was waded into by their circle. The circle said it could stay but one day. That's our system, filtered water. The library had so many wet hooks in it, I had to fish but first find the line. Then I was admitted to the lane of water mattresses. The beige cushion wavelets nailed together which, with couch buttons and hammers working in tandem. Addendum, Abyssidarian, uncle of Westmoreland, but with a wicked pack of cards, the Earl of Hard nudged his way into me for co-occupation, for occupation this, of chambers as the cedars impregnable of eye. No matter how many views we take now into Zuccotti Park, with all its honey locust trees thin and spindly against the cop lawnmower dusk, it will always remain impregnable of eye, elusive, ever out of reach, ever forward thrust on throneness beach to sink and rise again as Atlantis doesn't, but revolution always does, only to turn into bureaucracy as it must, so we can get grants and put art on the table. Eat, eat it, eat art, consume or create. Isn't there a way out of this either or? The far shore of Northumberland, bear cub racket, wicket tennis court oath, but you can't get away from the insurrection haze. We are it, the alien plinth myriad experiencing its selfnesses in the spur of the, in the spur, in the spur of the arachnid id idlikins galaxy. Samadhi octorober, and we had to jump rope with a two pound jump rope, and we had to jump rope with a two pound jump rope, a dow pound jump rope, exactly. And then passionate baristas is firing faster being barista. Experience is necessary, common sense even more so. I'm going in a yellow checker water taxi up the Hudson River against the current, and I see tiny white houses dotting the green river banks, and the West Point Academy on one side and the grail house of the village Zendo on the other. Perhaps standing in a coffee line is not the best place to hypnotize yourself. You're going to drip? Nods, yes. Drip. I am going to drip sexual fluids on the day parquet wood, hooray. He didn't, like, try to do anything, did he? No. The thing I remember is the friends. No, not a thing. Start over slower to faster bean go because I don't feel safe with the masturbation grape. I really hope I don't get so attractive that I get ignored, igneous, double sword of obsidian, blooper petal medicine, breath mint andronotone moat of a mouth around the castle tongue. The fact that we were married to air for the most part. I mean, we wanted to be musicians and had a great time, but it doesn't count because fame eluded us. What? Get me LOD Daily's editor on line one. Physical limits, porching roundness, tennis is skill, bandit snake pill bottles by the roadside. It is a quotation. It does feel cleaner though. Some people like Brenda told me to go to Zuccotti, that I wouldn't get arrested. Thank you, Brenda. Ariana said, I bet there are a lot of people falling in love here, looking out over the sea of blue tarp tents. The Zuccotti ocean wave washing away the dust of the green dollar crocus locust exuberance, awakening from hibernation to destroy us all for the health of the nation, a trickle down ivy drip into the veins of the only, the only, only the rich and richest dust percent. But these are obvious slobberings. Where was I going with this, Alicia? The raft drafts to the other side. Leave the raft behind. You can't carry it and get to the next place on the itinerary on the tour covering most of New England and red leaves. And I had a feeling of Mad Hatter once, but I have to go back to nude whirlwind. Maybe we can go back to Australia five hours before we get there for the first time. Waking up over the long cup shuttle to Kneekirk. Husbands at Kirkador, I have had four. Oink, 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 and oinkbert. I had the idea of walking into a Zuccotti green tarp tent and emerging on the top of Acropolis. Now hiring passionate baristas to service the democracy gods with nectar and ambrosia, broth for the kids, the little kids. Bah, 
Bah! Quiet down now, Johnson. It's just another failure Saturday long in the rear view now. Execute. I killed an enormous fly in my kitchen this morning when I died. The stillness in the air was like me flailing around with a dark green bathrobe knocking the stuffed animal owl from the shelf to get at the fly. Finally, I sprayed him on the high wall with the fruit and vegetable wash spray bottle. It fell on my spraying hand. I shook it off, sprayed it once more, and stomped it splat on the kitchen floor. Thus the, dental, thus the death penalty has proven itself effective in my destroyed kitchen. The exonerated flies of the afterlife march forth wingless from the kitchen cupboard and strafe me with their dead wings, flying from machine gun turrets in the plain belly bubble sky. The gibbous cycloptic cycloptician, cycloptometrist and medium eye of an insect having vengeance on my death drive flesh, unbacked up since last night when I finally signed up for the cloud and synced and backed up my files so that my love and I can enjoy a long and happy afterlife in the backup files of the sky, vaporized by heat, light, and the solar flares giving us precognitive or metacognitive eggnog experiences now as we foretell the fly guests we will kill in our dreams and wake up to pay for it with wrists bitten to the bone by action fruit flies. Sent to grind, memo from the bean of Shakespearean Motley College. So I was thinking for the next class we could change things up a bit. I just get really jealous. We went on a happy hour crowl all through the parents in a coked out grotto. George W. Bush's Coke dealer went to Stanford and we ended up at Zuccotti Park right in the middle of the occupation. Yeah, beer just adds unnecessary memories. The People's Library at Occupy Wall Street. Many people say it is a friendly entrance portal into an intimidating place. But that's like double dating your mother and your aunt. I have a high tolerance. I just like wet pavement after a rainstorm, make love in a train cross country. You infecting me in the sleeper car like I was Ava Marie Saint and you Cary Grant. The whole Mount Rushmore mountain range in your pants. Top heads of state, such head, the kind of head you can only get in a train with the wheels and rocky motion collaborating through the sustained intensity fellowship granted by the Cassiopeian constellation above. And only if you beg for it at least nine months. Don't be an artist. Those are labor pains, Uncle Dragon said on the banks of the Sava in Belgrade. But how did he know labor? He made his own printing company, Ars Grafica Belgrade, but never gave birth to children, but did birth a lot of books into the world. The two species are not comparable. Why they appear in the same sentence is to show how disguises fall off in close proximity with each other. And we shower our skins off since we can't shed them with the same splendor as the serpents coiled around our ankles in the rutabag pipe garden, portending a future of dawn music, wake up chords of the rooster throat in the year of the Chinese fire rooster sky. I'd like to be there. I went to so many things, I was never really there. Ew! Did it taste like booger? Did you go far? If you went to the drum circle and then the medicine tree of the shaman Michael during the full moon ritual, the policewoman told us, turn off the candles, guys. We blew out the mini wax votive candles. Laura will not blow out her candles at tonight's performance. And so Michael produced a choir of battery-powered votive flickering candle lights, and we still had our light and dilated pupils to suck in the sky through tiny pinholes in our heads of conch shell, beach break, wave shells, and wages. Moonstone pages of the dowry document shredded by King Lear when he cast his favorite daughter out for denying him a legal contract permitting incest. It's simply incorrect, and the whole family died to live it out and show us a map of how it may perchance to happen if we remain addicted to arrogance. If I bump into people, then I was alive and allowed to bring ten more in. To ten hell. I knew a friend there. Oh, hey, he introduced himself. Good hay hath no peer. What ho, a bottle of hay, father. Better than any dowry thou couldst grant me. Daughters visiting lightning bolts. You're here for an hour and we even less. The minutes sled down the hill and will not be counted. Back in Zuccotti Park blue tarp tent. That's a good cover. It gets ripped off by strong October wind gust. Are you riding here? Well, Russia's mom is here, so she didn't make it. But design Fridays we can meet up again. I know, I feel like I'm getting something this weekend. 
Ai 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 yo 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 ai 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 yo 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 Yonian Island Cove, Zakynthos Bay, storm racked. If you take a left past the medicine tent at Zuccotti, temporal spatioed totes ripped open. Would you like a cloaking device? Well, too bad. This is not the distant future past of your wet dream dossier scroll tongue stretching into outer space, where you can lick the hanging out out of the lounge act and turn us all into a revolution, which will again immediately devolve into be beehive behave rockracy erotocracy be raw hive rock how to get it out of that cycle of knockworse and cabbage and starving village of stumbling corpses two friends find it hard to part our horses neigh as we wave goodbye to each other goodbye you sir whither you just arrived and you're supposed to have Metal stability, like the first three months is all drugs. A palimpsest of hypocrisies and crises and Adderall gobbling tendencies make us friends by necessity under the same blue tarp storm tent. Oh fool, I shall go mad, oh fool, I am so glad. There's one part of my vulture shredded heart beak still sorry for thee. Art cold, my knave and puppy music stave? What sheet music flappeth in the dingy moth racket of sound waves so au courant as to be a legible goblin prattle printed on the air by a 3D printer? Why don't I be you and you be me? That's what he said. I don't usually reveal stuff like that. I mean, I do. Okay, have a good writing. We'll catch up. I forgot my cell phone and you kiss me to return it. I do that all the time. Welcome to my routine I. Let's pluck out the glass eyes of Gluster and go bowling with them, where the pins are toothpicks, Smallville beckons, but it's not the usual miniature place. The twin vultures interview us at the gates, and if we're not corpses, we won't enter, so you better put on a good act. Simply look like you are walking through your most ordinary day, a Wednesday, with a palm reading to look forward to later in the day, in the light of a Himalayan pink rose quartz salt lamp, for you cannot tell your future without it. You sold your intuition at the yard sale with the Savory Island summer camp tennis rackets. I don't care. I still want to be a librarian where no one has to bring any books back and can bring the ones they want you to read so we can have a common language to talk with that does not come from screens so we can have a cormorant language have a common language to talk with that does not come from screens but screams evolving into voicings from where we don't know in our heads hearths and heaths a heat language a sun when you speak from the gut thank you Thank you, Philip. A common language to talk with that does not come from screens. So many beautiful images there. My favorite is the candles in the park and the dilated eyes. Thank you, Christina, for inviting me to speak. Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, and thank you to some folks who I talked to before. I kind of, I was thinking about this night and thinking about Occupy as a kind of, you know, event and idea, and I think everyone, like Christina said, sort of has a different interpretation and iteration of what it was. And, you know, I was in grad school right when it started, and I wasn't an occupier or a camper and don't speak for the movement at all, but sort of think poetically, it does some interesting things. So some folks, Michael Peters, Danielle Lagers george Boyd Nielsen, Andy Peterson, a few others sort of gave me some useful ideas. So thanks for letting me sit on this side of the table. Six years later, Occupy seems almost quaint, a world we couldn't, one couldn't imagine the election of a gaudy one percenter in Donald Trump. But in the past six years, there's been a galvanized movement around populist leftist protests and activism, Black Lives Matter, 350.org, the Idle No More indigenous movement, Keystone XL and the DAPL pipeline, the Women's March, but also the rise of right wing and white supremacist hate groups. So Philip and I were talking earlier and he said he wanted to focus on time. So tonight I want to focus on space as a method of poetic inquiry and think about ideas of occupation arriving all together, embodiment, resistance and change. I guess I'm thinking proprioceptively to maybe use Olson's words, a sort of psychogeography, thinking about orientation, embodiment, interrelation of beings. I think 
taking up space is in a way the ultimate protest. The sit-in, the picket line, the strike, the occupation, the gathering, even the Abuelas de la Plaza de Mayo, the Argentinians standing for the disappeared. There's something about bodies in space that is disruptive, that forces a confrontation. Occupy was the hiccup and the steady breathing of the lungs of neoliberal mechanism of global capitalist thought, a physical disturbance at the sight of the heart and body of the market world. But nothing Occupy did was necessarily new, say the 60s American Indian movement occupation of the Bureau of Land Management, university sit-ins, civil rights sit-ins, ACT UP, and the AIDS movement protests that occupied the buildings of the NIH and the FDA. What was unique about Occupy was its spontaneity, the solidarity and utilization of social media as a mobilizing tool. What Occupy did was open and vocal protest against corporatism, but also new possibilities, dialogues, approaches, spontaneous celebration and lament, creative imaginings beyond what the organizers could predict. And it was in public, under the watchful eye of media and Wall Street, Occupy wasn't in CGI, it didn't have a marketing campaign, it didn't have a spokesperson, it was a collective body, something America can't and couldn't seem to wrap its mind around. A group of people collectively organized, despite our democratic ethos, disrupts our fetishization of leadership and flips it on its head. And that was the joy, people coming together outside the exigencies of capital to create, to protest, to block, to speak. And it made spaces across the country and through Western Europe in the same way the Arab Spring created spaces for free expression, longings for democratic society against state suppression, compassionate investment in communities against chronic unemployment. Don't forget the Arab Spring all began because of Mohamed Bouazizi, a Tunisian fruit peddler who immolated himself because he was harassed by the police for not having a permit. So something about this free space, right? And Occupy Sustained Energy was unique through the whole week, months of the encampment. There was a book, uh, Occupied Media Pamphlet Series, and it came out called Occupy Language. And two organizers say, if you were to compare scenes from Tahrir Square in Cairo, Syntagma Square in Athens, Zuccotti Park in New York, and Puerta del Sol in Madrid, you would see very similar occupations with elements including free libraries, childcare, health services, food, legal support, media, and art. And they were all, you know, all these organizations and relationships created in this space using direct democracy, all unique, but at the same time alike that they constitute a new global phenomenon. So I would argue that poetry offers a similar space of direct action, a kind of old global phenomenon, to confront what Robert Duncan called in a letter to Denise Levertov, the crossing of the inner and outer reality of our world. Poetry as a space to consider the effects of world and mind, macro to micro, from personal to political. Poetry as a space outside capital, always, ideally, the good poetry anyway, the Bill Knott School of Poetry, or Peter Lamborn Wilson, the temporary autonomous zone of the poem, the reading. Poetry is the sacred, place of, sacred space of placemaking, of longing and imagining, documenting and complicating desire and despair. And poetry can move outside of the quiet space and work as an agitation, a radical disregard for form or civility. In No Infinite Number Three, I published an essay by an American poet who lives in the UK named Justin Katko. It was called From the Graveyard, and it was a response to an essay in Tripwire magazine about UK protest poetry. And Katko calls poetry, he describes it as a force of incredible fury that at its best, rarest, and most ungentle performs an absolute reorganization of the minds of its participants, tunneling and demolishing beneath a nullifying mainstream, undergoing constant preparation and inhumane refreshment. I love this idea of refreshing, right? Refreshing the feed, always refreshing the feed. Poems are raw forms of judgment that in the end we accept or don't. Some of us like it super raw. And wasn't Occupy the rawest form? Undeniable visibility, encampment, raucous marches, continual protests, noise, and people's microphone crawling out of the anonymity of the internet and day jobs into a public sphere of open expression. Philip edited or facilitated an anthology <laughs> called the Occupy Wall Street Anthology. It's 700 pages or something. And this is a poem called The People's Microphone by the UK poet Chris Cheek. He says, the people's microphone is a system of amplification, rain, requiring no electricity, no thing, leaves, 
external divide or device whatsoever other than the human voice. So that when one person says is rain, amplified and attended to through leaves, an agency of collective reiteration. By these means, what one voice is rain, that might remain objectified is embodied by all who hear it leaves and amplified to those out of earshot. So that when I say, I mean what I say, rain, people attending, repeating that phrase, resounding these words for themselves, leaves. And when I say, you need to be alert, rain, that too is embodied and understood, the point of view shared necessarily. I commend the people's microphone, leaves, to us in our deliberations, our debate, rain, knowing that whatever is uttered, leaves, will be amplified and further heard. I love the way the rain and leaves sort of repeats, kind of like a sort of October day. When I think of poetry and protest, I think of the danger of the strident, the polemic, what Duncan feared in Levertov's poems in a letter in 1971. It is a disease of our generation that we offer symptoms and diagnoses of what we are in the place of imagination and creations of what we are. Dale Smith and Poets Beyond the Barricades, Rhetoric, Citizenship, and Dissent, which I think is a great book if you're interested in this subject looks at Sam Hamill's Poets Against the War, which is 30,000 poets sort of collected online. And he asks, the efforts of such groups to use poetry to alter public space raise important questions. Is it enough to voice opposition to government policy, even if few listen or respond? Or should rhetors expect their work to be recognized and rewarded with specific actions in these instances? More importantly, how do subaltern claims that run counter to a larger ideological environment reach a legitimate and powerful audience? I don't have answers, but Occupy began to challenge those governing ideologies. One example to Dale Smith's question comes from Egypt in the Arab Spring. Maged Zahar, the editor of the Tahrir of Poems, Seven Contemporary Egyptian Poets, published in 2014, writes in the introduction, these are the poets from the generation of the revolution, and this is revolutionary poetry, which exactly means that this poetry has nothing to do with sloganeering. Most of these poets participated in the demonstrations and sit-ins in Tahrir against Mubarak, but they also had their own aesthetic revolution against the bareness of cultural life under Mubarak. This bareness resulted from the world lack of interest in them. Ibrahim El Said's poem, Untitled. Because the fascism that grew in schools currently invades the streets, my girlfriend will be afraid of her body, her neutral body, like a trustworthy ally in the battle of love. Before Christmas, the trees appeared smaller and made in China. The red ornament smelled like strawberry that is covered by a layer of sticky white mold. Lizards roam the street and the state is a ghost that presses over our bony fingers. Thus, we will leave the city behind, heading for the desert, the ugly concrete wave breakers, block vision on both sides, and the beach behind us is full of gelatinous skeletons pulsing in the dark of jellyfish that were ambushed by a cold wave. When I teach my students about the role of the lyric in poetry, I emphasize the lyric impulse as one of intimate space, of proximity and trust, where speaker is speaking to you, reader, here at the moment, where Occupy created a public space for negotiations of the private concerns of citizens, forming a community of solidarity, engaged participation, shared experience. So too does poetry offer a kind of intimate public private space, a poem read at a microphone or through a bullhorn, or a poem read in a private carousel in Lamont. The effect of the voice speaking outside of the standard order of mediated corporate and media discourse. This conversation between internal and external is the realm of the poem, the meeting point of experience outside of narrative or context that provided in fiction. The lyric of now direct experience, epiphany from the ancient Greek to come suddenly into view. This is my poem after Fanny Howe's book, A Needle's Eye, Passages Through Youth, about kind of Johar Sarnayev, and she has this image of St. Francis that I start with. It's called Homo Sacer, which is bare life. I open myself to surveillance like St. Francis, standing at the wood line without clothes, the villagers embarrassed for the marks and scars they gave him. At the edge of the meadow, a procession, 
robed and wreathed, barefoot mendicants, hair of laurels, a single tambourine, voices above branchless trees, fecund hope grown in northeastern gardens, uninterrupted bird song, a prayer wall for activists. Someone scrawled a name so small, we thought it an accident. Did prayer stop the wall? Did prayer stop the killing? Or did prayer stop the heart from falling through the floor? I tie myself to something at the bus stop so I don't fall through the street into the river. My heart beats erratically, unsure of its own path forward, as if to beat or flutter a wire errantly crossed. To save or be saved on the 751, tomorrow the sun will go away and the light through the window will be flat and empty, depthless. I lie in pasture, unsure when living and lying begins or ends, which persona will I create today, whose clothes should I put on? This energy of bells ringing across the eaves and gutters, who is our warlord of night? When will we go to battle the lawyers? Courtrooms are instruments of the powerful, not scales of justice rendered in statues from myth. A misplaced trust in a system that defies you. Survival is not happiness. Bare life is just enough, says the state adjudicators. All is fair beneath the wig and robe, unless you are unclothed and your head is shorn. Poetry takes our bare life and renders it with feeling, being, alternatives for living. And what did Occupy generate if not a vision of a different world with direct and powerful feeling? The rage of citizenry at the egregious heights of American public wealth. The human drone of the people's mic. The silent terror of pecuniary debt or foreclosure. The powerful optimism of solidarity, congregation in squares and parks. Andrew Riker in Privacy Policy, an anthology of surveillance poetics, says poets are our professional observers, not mere legislators, but observers, catalogers, archivists of time, experience, imagination. When I think about poets and poetry since Occupy is how the nature of that observation has changed, how the shifting American landscape and the deep fissures within our communities are revealed now in stark relief each day, each year, starker and starker, unavoidable. Another poem I published by Nick Dembski and Dolly Lemsky, they co-wrote these poems. Um, he's from Washington, Wisconsin, she's from Chicago. It's called Going Without Insurance is the New Way to Be a Cowboy. <laughs> but a rotten tooth and blurry vision. Then you're a regular. Suffer from night sweats. Sometimes you feel sad and run out of birth control. They might lose your blood work. Waiting for the bill, double charge, still smoking and hiding from your mother. They lost the game. Stranger seems to sleep on the couch. An invitation. The cats play with garbage. Always need a ride. Drink more water. Exercise. But how? I'm so American, self-reliant and sick. Didn't Occupy attempt to embody this American sickness? Debt, economic stagnation, overfed, undernourished, hypercapitalized, alienated from ourselves and our feelings, our own comrades, and put it on display in a corporate space? What happens when the masses organize in a space designed for private capital? What happens when the festering sore of neoliberalism takes off its band-aid and presents itself naked and screaming? Martin Luther King, in his letter from Birmingham Jail, which I teach every semester, says, you may well ask why direct action, why sit-ins, marches, and so forth. Isn't negotiation a better path? Indeed, this is the very purpose of direct action, to create such a crisis and foster such a tension that a community which has constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. It seeks to dramatize that the issue that it can no longer be ignored. And ignored Occupy was not. It tore through the national and international news feeds, spread like a bacteria of resistance to austerity across the squares of the US and Western Europe. But it's not democracy that's threatening to the state. It's space that's so threatening. Occupied space challenges the constraints of municipal authority and state-sanctioned control of power over housing, economy, education. Occupy dissolved just as quickly as it started. State de police departments gathered on conference calls to address uniform tactics for shutting down the occupations. 
you can read the whole brick report by the FBI of the Occupy Boston. It's like hundreds of pages long. They built a new FBI building that I can see from my house in Chelsea now, which is great. But remember when Amy Goodman from Democracy Now! was chasing down the New York City garbage truck as they threw the Occupy Library in the trash, right? At dawn, that was so beautiful. The spaces of Occupy disturbed this business as usual and forced publics to confront the challenges of our post-recession, post-9-11 world. And there's something beautiful about the failure of Occupy. In the same way that poetry in many ways fails or reveals our failures to ourselves, our own humanness, mortality, grievable lives. There was an a anthology published this January called Resist Much, Obey Little by Spite and Dival. It's like 700 pages, and it was put together between November and January. And Sandra Simones wrote this poem called Atopia. See, the thing is, poet, is that you're failing. You're failing at capitalism. You're failing at self-care. You're failing at feminism. You're failing at activism. None of this you see is your fault, but it's still happening. The failures, the fractures, the opening like an infection that starts at your elbow and spreads to the depths of your being. You spend the night reading about a god cleaved in two. The dream, dream demons come true. They haunt you and your friends. They are the ancient gods, the ones overthrown. Capitalism is shrinking and the rich have gotten more violent. Capitalism could fail and win at the same time, poet. This is called crisis. Of course, the swans and the trees and the birds and the buzzing, they don't care, they hum. Capitalism won, I went on a run, I'm dumb, I hum on my long run. I think a lot about the crisis narrative that we live in, right? And one thing Occupy did that we need is a new narrative against this sort of apocalypticism. We're in a radical moment, and I think the fear narrative of crisis is not useful for us as a people or a poetics. A poetry of fear and worry and cowering and misery is antithetical to the poetic impulse Duncan reminds us of. It is a narrow, caged-in view of the possibilities of human speech, embodiment, song, action. I think there's much to be hopeful for today, to be grateful for and to struggle for about poetry, people, possibilities. I struggle to remind myself that and Occupy, when I think of it, reminds me that we can return to it theoretically, poetically, imaginatively, as the cloud grow darker in Washington and the world spins on its strange axis. But on what I kind of want to end with and think about for our discussion is Occupy reminds us that we all need access to new space, affordable space, accessible space for people to share, create, embody, and push a new vision of thinking forward. And if it has to happen here, this radical space, or somewhere else, or somewhere outside, how can we get there? What spaces exist? I'm going to end with two poems. One I wrote on January 20th and one that is different. Uruboros. Round the tail eats the face, the stars and stripes mittens on the most brazenly clueless. Happy New Year at Cha Time Bubble Tea, the world in an oyster boba pearl, an archipelago of sadness. When Jung was dying, he asked his son to take him to the window to see the mountains one more time. Philomen, sorceress of psyche, reaches into unconscious longing, sorrowful cup of tear-stained winter, end of an epoch after the end of an error, black gods of the asphalt, who is the arbiter of faith? Merton wasn't a beatnik, but sun signs Aquarius today, as the water bearer pours out a legacy of grief down the steps of the capital. Park yourself in front of the TV. Take a waltz around Walden Pond. Round we go, walking out of the subway to see the same street in a different light. A different sadness on the hooded lids of walkers. A jingling cup. Broken Zeus with his coffee and cigarette. Ash to ash to dust cloud engulfing the monument. In Logan's Run, this old sci-fi movie, the caretaker of the mangled capital sleeps in a tattered flag under Henry Harrison's faded portrait, hunted and preserved, destroyed and refound. Onwards, dear destiny, sound the angel's trumpet. And I'll finish with a translation by the Venezuelan poet Victor Valera Mora that Ann Boyer translated that I published in the first issue of the magazine. It's called Our Task. He was sort of a 60s, 70s radical poet, Marxist poet. For our task, for our stubborn hearts, and how we have stayed horizons, we who have lived in the history, we helped build, say a lot about it, but with a little sadness. 
and we save our radiant joy for what the people who come after us will build. We can fall, slaughtered by terrible bullets, but always our reinforcements rise, the hungry child fierce, shaking with her first verse, as the either or of any dilemma, the difference between a radical of clouds and a militant of wind. This song never has an ending and always leaves an opening, a gap from which emerges a slight suggestion, which the poet grasps and grasps and grasping finally pulls up to bring each next day in. We, the poets of the people, sing a thousand years and again. Thank you. Lapel mic hors d'oeuvres will be served shortly. <laughs> Philip, how did the library Occupy start with you and Stephen? How did you guys get involved? Uh, well, it was already going, and uh, I just showed up, and it was it was it had already started. I, I I didn't. I sort of wandered around there, like in late September, but then my real entrance initiation happened October 1st, and then by then the, the, the library was already going, and Betsy Fagan started it. Mm -hmm. uh, she is a fantastic poet librarian, and uh, she just got up at one of the assemblies and, and said, hey, I'm a librarian, I, I want to start a library, and everyone was like, which means yes. Um, so. It started, and then and then I I, I got there, and I, I started uh, taking pictures of everything on my little flip phone, and Betsy was like, "Do you want to work here, or are you just going to take pictures with your flip phone?" And I was like, "Yes, you're correct. I'm drowning in the society of the spectacle, flip phone edition," and so I I started working there, and that's where I met Stephen, and. Uh, Working there is kind of, you know, it was more like play, we would play there as playtime. It was like a great playtime corner. We would like hang out and write and record ISBN numbers and <laughs> ISBN numbers became totally psychedelic and trans-inducing <laughs> things. You know, it was like the matrix green ISBN numbers, waterfalls coming down, you know. Uh, did people just like compose poems as they walked by? Because how did you collect all of like the 700? Because I think it's a really valuable free kind of resource to like dig into. Yeah, that was Steven's idea. And I was like, great, let's do it. And we, we, we went over to my apartment and we, you know, typed and, and put it, pulled everything off the email and printed, printed stuff out there and then made photocopies. And uh, yeah, we just, we just, I think we put up a sign inviting people to send us their stuff and we got tons of stuff. Yeah, it was great. I know. I think I wrote it while I was sitting right next to you. Yeah. 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 It was a great. It was a great place for graphomania, <laughs> yeah. among other things. Yeah. Did you ever visit? Yeah, I went one time. The first thing I remember um, from the New York one was just I'd never seen so many cops in my life. I'd never seen. Mm. I'd never seen so many cops with camcorders. I'd never seen so many cops on segways. I'd never seen so many cops in those little. Um, tower things mm -hmm. that look like the marching things from Star Wars. Right. Yeah. And yeah, it was, uh, it was much more um, 
hostile than I think Boston was. It was much more confrontational, and there was a real kind of you know vitriol. And one of the things I wanted to mention too is that like John Zuccotti, I read this book called Fear City about when New York went broke in 1975. And Zuccotti was sort of like a darling of New York and a real friend of the city. And he worked for Abraham Beam's administration, the, the mayor. And but so basically the way they got out of the debt crisis was by having the banks buy the uh, the debt under certain like obligations that they had to start um, privatizing a lot of New York social services and they had to start giving like tax breaks for development for new buildings and that was when Donald Trump bought the Roosevelt Hotel right that was sort of like his first big development property and so we can thank John Zuccotti for that work. Wow. Yeah but I thought it was interesting that he's kind of like this interesting specter of like that space because I don't think I'd ever even really visited Wall Street I had no reason to go and so it was like <laughs> it was really wild I mean I think yeah and that's why I was really excited by it, because like, the contrast of energy was just so extreme. Yeah. Yeah. The trees were great. There were yeah. these honey locust trees. It was a beautiful park, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And it was still, it was still green when, when it started. So, right. so it, was, it felt, the trees felt like, it felt like they were protecting us. But everything yeah. else around there is so awful and forbidding yeah. and gray. Yeah, yeah. There's that great... Uh, yeah, what made it beautiful was that we were all there. Right, exactly. And, and the, I love that big red sculpture. I forget what it's called. But I saw Robert Thurman give this great Dharma talk there. The Buddhist day. guy? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. Anybody Questions? Have, yeah, thoughts, feelings, Questions. reactions. Yeah. That's just a recording mic. Uh, yeah, uh, I was wondering um, how do you relate the role of uh, poetry to the actual situation not only happening here in the States but uh, all around the world and how can poetry help to create this new narrative of hope or any 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 other possibilities that take us away from uh, all the negative things happening I, I think the problem is with narrative itself actually I, th I think narrative itself is a form that causes such a, a, a stranglehold on our freedom of thought. Um, and I feel like poetry is this great uh, big exfoliating sponge that kind of takes the narrative <laughs> coating of dust on our, off our bodies, you know? And, and uh, yeah. How would you remove the narrative from this moment? Narrative there is no narrative. No. How would you scrub the orange off? Yeah, that, scrub the orange. Oh, scrub the orange, the orange toupee. Yes. Um, how would you scrub? Well, it, it's not there. You know, that's the problem is that, you know, it's, it's not there at all. It's just that this, this semblance, right. this, this, uh, this clone, this, this, this clone of dust, you know, is there. And it needs that orange wig to signify itself into some kind of existence right. of, or some kind of semblance of power but it's it's not really there and we just have to I feel like we just have to make that as clear as possible <laughs> right I mean I think for me it's about like putting poetry in places that are accessible because I think there's so much interesting and radical and political writing happening and if you there's like a, a listserv called the small press distribution which sends out like all the independent poetry books and there's just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds every week and just really in intense radical you know cross-cultural international poetries but it's like not accessible and it doesn't like make it into the newspaper. It doesn't make it into, you know, national magazines. So I think it's like a question of like how, how poetry can be visible or something, you know, because there's just so much there. And it's, I don't know, I don't feel like it's as accessible as these other kind of dominant orange narratives, you know? Yeah. yeah. But so any I, kind yeah, of, yeah. yeah, any kind of like public hearing or listening to poetry is great. I mean, it, there's a lot of that happening. Yeah. Yes. I don't know how to phrase this question, but what it, you were exploring space, and that made me think what you think that if the dynamic is different, if it is different between invading a space to take and occupying a space to like reclaim, like what's the difference between both dynamics that involve using a space? Right. 
I think it's really important because I think there was um, native reservations that had unoccupy movements, right? And so they were trying to un they were trying to pay attention to land that was occupied, right? And I think it's really problematic because you know the sort of Israeli situation is an occupation of sort of Palestinian land, right? So I think it's really just about context. And I think what was interesting about Zuccotti Park was that it was a it was an uninhabitable, inhuman space for people to gather, and that was the sort of the, I don't know, the mycopoetics or something, the sort of fungus that grew there that was so interesting. But yeah, I think, I think it's just really important to be attentive to what spaces need to be unoccupied and challenged in that way. Yeah, it's such a complicated term. I mean, I, 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 like, the, I like the maneuver with the term occupy because there's, a, there's like this rich history of taking uh, these really dark words, words with really problematic histories, like slurs, like queer, for instance, used to be a total slur, but then it turned into a term of empowerment. So I think that's the, that's the case with Occupy, you know, it's, it's, occupation is obviously horrific and uh, something that the United States has unfortunately and tragically been besotted with for way too long. But to take that idea of occupying, of occupation, and turn it around and say, you know, we're, we're here occupying for poetry, for healthcare. That was the big thing is like, people kept trying to build this master narrative. What are you here for? Oh, there's like, I get like 10 different answers and most people don't even know. Their mouth is full of some sandwich. Well, so what, you know, that's great. There's like this many stories, many narratives, all polyvalent, you know, at once, you know, simultaneous. And that's, that's what was the strength of it. The problem was when that started to congeal at the same time as the police undercover presence provocateur, agent provocateur started to congeal and everything started to get over-organized out of fear of the infiltration of the police. And then we became police as well as the police becoming police. And that was just a disaster. So, so it, you know, it started really great. Like the first half of October was amazing. And then, and then sort of toward the end around Halloween. I felt like Halloween was the last, the last gasp of hope, and then and then everything kind of got sozzled away. But it continues, you know. It continues in other forms. Right. I would love to find a different term than occupy. I'm sure right. there are many. I was thinking about um, the Black Lives Matter protests and the way they uh, occupied the highways and the way they blockaded highways, and that you know some conservative state legislators are trying to make that a felony to block, you know, just traffic kind of not harming anyone, but somehow like, you know, disrupting whatever economic speed. And I thought that was really interesting that there's this, just the presence of bodies in a place they shouldn't be is just really disturbing. So yeah. So, but I thought that was like a really interesting, I thought that those were really effective. And those are, again, like those, that, those tactics have been used before, but really effective. I like, uh, I really love uh, uh, Fred Moten's formulation. He, 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 he talks about this beautifully. Um, he says, black life matters, you know? So there, but there's something in that move about taking off the plural and making it really singular and right. unique as each life is unique. And, and yeah, and I mean, yeah, and it's, it's insane. I mean, like, yeah, blocking, Traffic is a felony, but uh, you know, murdering someone for no reason, you know, right. you can. That's like whatever. It's like yeah, and occupation is really about. I mean, like, what is life like, then? Yeah, you know, like, and it's about the kind of living being and be like a worker's lockout or something of like a factory or a job place. It's like you're not a labor; you're a person. You exist in this workplace. You know. Yeah. 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 And that's why Occupy was exciting because it was about a real kind of life-affirming moment in a world of a lot of destructive <laughs> Yeah, and moments. just the fact that it was happening around the world in different cities at right. different times, and the way it, would, it, would, it was kind of like a, a spark would go over there and start the fire elsewhere, and then that would cause another fire. Right. It was great to see those correspondences happening. That was really amazing how global it felt. Yeah. I also felt like, it would, and I know I'm not holding the mic, I'm so bad, I don't know. Um, but the, 
what I recognize in Occupy, what I recognize in Black Lives Matter, I don't even know how to put it into language, is that there is something um, um, uh, I don't want to use the word genuine, but there's something um, in which I see individuals generating an action um, uh, that is um, of the moment, in of themselves, um, that is, um, it's contagious, but it's also, it, it, there's some physicality, there's vulnerability, there's something about these actions that stem from an individual body. There's something where you have a sense that an individual has put something at stake, yeah. and that it, and, and in that way poetry, that in that way I do align it with poetry, because it's like it reorganizes space around a single body that made that single gesture, and then that gesture alone. Uh, sometimes I, you know, I take part in a lot of marches, obviously, and some of those can be very frustrating in, in, in that um, they feel static, um, they must seem static from above, but in their individual, you know, interactions, they are utterly, you know, um, transformative. Um, but there's something about these more intimate, act and I, I don't know why I associate Occupy and Black Lives Matter with, a, a, with intimate gestures that accrue, but, um, um, I don't know if that, am, am I, is anything resonating? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, I agree. Maybe because I'm a child of the 70s, and so the civil rights movement was, was overwhelmingly, um, breathtakingly um, full of awe for me. Um, and um, I never could find my way into actions um, that, that um, because that was sort of, um, did anyone else feel this? I guess these monumental marches. Um, and But there was something about, um, that I didn't feel I, I could enter again. Um, um, because they were so, they were almost intimidatingly um, immense and right. uh, full of majesty and um, as how they were narrated and how they were photographed. Right. Um, but something about Occupy, I'm thinking of your portal that the library created or the, the, the portal that Black Lives Matter permits an individual to enter. I don't know how to express this. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe it's because the civil rights movement had so many um, institutions behind it, like the church. There were all these 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 um, um, pre-existing institutions. Whereas, felt like Occupy Black Lives Matter has has had to act without some of that, um, or was creating or an organism in of itself. Um, well, it's always in that way. Yeah. It, it, right, it wasn't as successful. <laughs> successful Occupy, but then it... it well, a lot of the people, a lot of the leaders of the civil rights movement were murdered, they were murdered. by the American government. So, you know, we, we have to start over. Mm -hmm. You know, and th this was like a great surge of starting over. Right. And it, now it continues. Yeah, and it's the, yeah, the contingency is the time that forced the action that needs to be taken. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, Occupy died, but Bernie Sanders was the Occupy candidate and Donald Trump ran on an Occupy campaign. He ran on like a working class, you know, anti-elitist, anti-Wall Street campaign, like the biggest con in American history. But that was the language he used, the anti-NAFTA, anti-TTP or whatever it was. So, so I think, yeah, it's the contingencies of the moment. But I also think that activism is like that kind of grand narrative is problematic because everyone can't be in the streets all the time and everyone can't be there. And so if you're teaching in a classroom, you know, that can be your moment of, you know, kind of. Uh, engagement or something that kind of space that you can create because it's really just sort of awareness and like a retuning of your own you know self and body and feeling that so yeah I think that I think the narratives of the movements like get, get complicated because they get politicized and I think the personal action that's why poetry for me is kind of the most valuable and to your first question that there's just so much great poetry that has come out of these movements and there's just a lot of writing and thinking happening and it adds to discourse and kind of challenges us all yeah, totally. I mean, that, that, that's great because that, that makes me think, yeah, it's not separate, non-separation, right? Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not like we have these spaces where we go to and we do this, mm -hmm. which is a consumerist narrative, right? right. But we have, we, it's not separate. We're, we're always making poetry and we're, we're, as long as we're acting from awareness, right? From the breath, we're, we're making poetry, we're, we're, we're performing activist gestures, and that can happen, that happens anywhere, anytime. Right. It doesn't have to be cordoned off, or, or maybe it's even 
more effective in these like daily, ordinary, so-called ordinary interactions. You know? I think so, yeah. I mean, I have my students giving speeches right now for this class that I'm teaching, and like that's what I try to teach them. That's like, I literally try to say that I, I teach like composition and writing. I say I teach embodiment. Mm -hmm. Like I teach that you're like a voice and you exist and you have like a kind of, of you engage in a social world. Because I think what these movements do is they bring social interactions together in a way that we feel divided and separated. Mm. And so that narrative becomes really important. But even when the movement isn't there, isn't visible, it doesn't mean we're still not connected in those ways. Yeah. yeah. I, I've been teaching Dogen, the, the, the great Japanese Zen philosopher Dogen in my, in my class. And uh, he has this great part in uh, Genjo Kon where he says, to say, I will go forth and experience the myriad things is delusion. But to say the myriad things will go forth and experience themselves is awakening, right? Like that feather, that's awakening. Right? So, so uh, you know, so so we're but we're constantly distracted by being catered to as consumer economic units. That you know, you are the one, the one. You know, like you are the you are the one who will go forth and do it all. You know, and it's, and it's like it's not that. It's the myriad things will go. Forth and experience themselves. In other words, we, we're all together. There's mm -hmm. no separation between us. The poem is always a choral poem. It's always a choral right. experience that we're collaborating on together right now. Does anybody else want to say something? Okay. Where are you guys from? I'm from Panama. Are, are you students here? From Colombia. I yes. Okay, cool. In the education school. Cool. Um, and I've just been thinking about space and also how taking of space um, like as an expression, as a vocabulary. And sometimes it enrages me that, and I hate saying both sides, but both sides are using the same vocabulary for like totally different mm. purposes. So in Panama, we're undergoing a sexual education crisis, a lack of sexual education crisis. Mm. And last year we organized a march and it was really difficult in a small, conservative, super religious country. But we got 2,000 people and that felt like such a victory to go on the streets and protest against the patriarchy for equal rights for women and men, for equal marriage. And then a week later, 20,000 people, super conser conservative, they took the same space on the same street and had like a counter protest. Mm. And it was just so disheartening. It's like our... Our efforts look the same, but they're so different. Right. I just wanted to share that. No, that's like, powerful, yeah. Just think about that. Actually, I have something. And it's a little bit related, so I'm glad. Thank you for saying that first. Um, the idea of like there being a, a beauty to the failure of this, and, uh, and having heard everything you both said about the danger of calling social movements like this all one thing and calling it universally the same in some ways where there's like a plan or an attempt to make something successful in the future. But coming from like a poetic standpoint, what can be said that's been learned about how to build communities that in the future things may be more quote successful in these kind of areas or these arenas? Because when it's space, whether it's um, the, the kind of inverse of the space that you talked about, um, or if it's anything political or it's a specific like whether it's a specific thing to banks or anything like how can a unified goal be more successful when the community that's being built through the poetry you guys are sharing is taking these lessons from the previous failures i mean i think the the spaces to, were designed to be divided and there's there's certain like spaces and rules that are are created to to sow this division and so it's like this the example you make in the protests like there's it's hard to find opportunities to even engage in those kind of dialogues right without sort of being like tit for tat you know we have this many you have that many but the narrative is still like being fought over so in this sense it's not even just the protest itself it's this greater idea of what the country's trying to go through or what people are trying to say so i think it's really hard because like those divisions are inherent and they're you know um exacerbated and people like make those divisions clear and I don't know I've, there's a book called Times Square Red Times Square Blue that Sam Delaney the sci-fi writer wrote and it was about the uh, theaters in the 42nd Street area of New York 
And they were the kind of like porn theaters and sort of like these cheap movie theaters. And he argued that that space was really important because it was an interclass space of interaction yeah. that people of different classes could come and interact. And obviously he was mostly interested in the sexual interactions. But he said the Times Square Development Project destroyed that and it created a sort of space for only tourists to come and that the people of New York were no longer allowed to kind of interact there. And so there's something about like these kind of spaces where you don't interact with people outside of your class, outside of your sort of like community. And that becomes hard. And when you don't interact, there is no opportunity for that creation. So these big movements create opportunities for that where you get to meet someone maybe you didn't know or lived on the other side of the train or something. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. For me, that's like really important. That's what I've been thinking about because these divisions are really, really real. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's a great question. I, 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 uh, I would say the most important thing is to, to go there, you know, to go there and check it out yourself and, and participate in it yourself and have open conversations again and again and fail better and, and, and with more kindness, right. and with more openness. Uh, I, have, I don't have know. Have four thousand I mean, people next time, you know. Like, yeah, yeah. You know, like, like that, that, thats the good, you know. There's, there. That's always, that's always part of the crisis, you know, that we're not in fascist choreographed lockstep. That the essence of our coming together is difference and conversation and debate and dialectics, and we have to deal with that. You know, we can't erase that and all come together in, in, in some kind of hideous, uh, non-thinking lockstep. Uh, and yet, the people who are in lockstep have uh, certain powers, ways of oppressing us because of that efficiency built into their system. But it is an efficiency that it, uh, destroys itself, ultimately. Just a question of we can, if we can help it along <laughs> faster and if, if we can you know, help ourselves as well together, even with all these disagreements. Yeah, I, I was wondering, uh, today, just before coming here, I was having a class about social movements. So it's really interesting to connect it all. And I was wondering because like sometimes you need to think about these social movements as if something was successful or not, like if they achieve the aim that they were having. And I was thinking in, in, in this particular case and especially with poetry and let's say with poetry occupying the space of our daily lives. Uh, like how how do you see the the result there, or do you think like poetry doesn't play in this same realm of uh, need to be successful or not, but it could be like something uh, just beyond that? Yeah, I think like music is sort of like the ultimate kind of like you know um, collaborative poetry and the songs, and I think the U.S. used to have an interesting sort of like folk tradition and songs that sort of came out of certain movements that they don't have anymore. But I think in Spain and Greece and other countries, like there is like a real sense of kind of, you know, song and poetry and playing with words because a lot of the narrative of sort of, you know, whatever, you know, state controlling powers is to control the language. And so to play around with that, I think is really important. So I think even if it's not like poetry, like handwritten on a little scroll and handed out, like there still is this sense of language being, you know, teased and played with and sung and, you know, as a group. And I think there's, yeah, I think it's, there's always opportunity and whether it's like successful or not, it's hard to say, but those songs like stick around, you know? And yeah. I'm not versed enough in other languages to make, to make examples, but. Yeah, one, one thing that really cheered me up at, at Zuccotti was uh, how nervous the undercovers were about <laughs> our writing. Like, one of them, I was sitting writing by this flower bed, and he was like, what are you writing? You guys are always writing, you know, like, how long are you going to be here for? How long do you think you'll be here? You know, that kind of thing. It made them really nervous. Because you can't we categorize it. <laughs> like, yeah. like, yeah, what are these people writing? What is writing? What is my life? Are we, do I write too? Yeah, I write too. So am I like that person? That's this great Lehrstück Brechtian dialectical role reversal thing where like the cops become poets and the poets become cops. And that was kind of always happening there, zapping back and forth, you know, like 
Facilitator, not editor. Oh, oh, but you're my friend, I love you. Oh, you're right, okay. Oh, excuse me, sir, I don't want to interrupt you eating your sandwich, but how long do you think you guys will be here for? <laughs> you know, it's like that, it's just obvious undercovers, and then, yeah. wait, how am I an undercover? <laughs> like, how, how do I out myself from that position? You know, how do I be queer myself back into, you know, awareness? So, so it, 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 it was great because it reminded me writing does have power. It's just a kind of, it doesn't show itself, you know, as, 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 uh, as, as we've been, I mean, you know, we've been taught that for something to show itself, it has to be, you know, like show busy and glitzy and, and uh, reality TV everything. And, and, but this quiet way that poetry has of, of uh, uh, being this, agent, this element of non-separation, of, of like showing, showing us, actually demonstrating non-separation uh, in, in so many different ways. It, yeah, music, uh, signage, right. and everywhere. You know. Overheard conversations, I mean, John Ashbery said, it, you know, I, I, the fount of my poetry is uh, overheard conversation. You know, overheard conversation, or he said specifically overheard conversation in, in America. But then, when he went to France, he started uh, overhearing things through uh, newspapers and magazines and in his own head, and then reinvented everything. You know, so yeah. Thank Conversation is poetry. <laughs> Thank you, Philip.